Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Sorry. Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolu Tando Nematswerani. I'm welcoming you on behalf of Discovery, Summer, UFFP, and SAPPF. This is our sixth webinar in the third wave um, that we have initiated uh, since the start of this third wave. We will be focusing on a, a very important topic uh, that I think, uh, I think you'll all agree needs to be addressed during this uh, third wave, uh, which is that of maternal health and obstetric care. We have addressed this topic on our previous waves. And I think with uh, the evolving data in this space and you know, having experienced some of the fatalities uh, for some of our pregnant women, we felt that the experts should, should come tonight and address uh, this important topic and share some of the latest insights and guidance around what is appropriate in the management of um, you know, uh, COVID-19 in maternal care. So we've got um, three esteemed guests that are going to be addressing this topic, uh, which is titled Understanding COVID-19 Maternal and Perinatal Outcomes, and also addressing the issue of vaccinations in pregnancy, which I think has also been very topical. Some house rules before we start. Uh, this webinar is CPD accredited. Certificates take about a week to be ready. Uh, if you've got any queries, please send them to cpd at discovery.co.za. And um, for those uh, you know, who would want to, 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 to view uh, these webinars, please note that they are available on our Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Um, during the course of the webinar, we will have our three speakers, but uh, feel free to share any questions. Uh, the, the, the speakers will address the questions at the end of the webinar, so we'll not have uh, questions in between. But we'll try and make sure that uh, we collate uh, your questions and uh, you know, group them in themes so that we can get our experts to actually address them as best as they can. We usually get high volumes, but we try and get through these as best as we can. At the end of the webinar, we also have a poll. Please uh, give us some feedback in terms of how you've experienced the webinar. And uh, this is an opportunity for us to get the feedback and share it with our experts. And also, uh, you know, it's also an opportunity for us to improve uh, should, should there be a requirement for us to do so. So this webinar, uh, like I said, will be led by three experts. The first one will be Prof Salume Maswime, who is uh, not new to this platform. Like, uh, like we said, she, the, the two profs uh, were here in the first and the second wave. So welcoming them back. Um, it's always a pleasure to have them, but they are joined by um, someone else that I'm going to introduce shortly. So Prof Maswime is an uh, associate professor at the head of, and the head of the global surgery division at the University of Cape Town. She's the president of the South African Clinician Scientist Society, and she's also an obstetrician and gynecologist. She's a former Discovery Foundation um, Mass Gen uh, Fellow at the Massachusetts uh, General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So we are excited to have her back here. And then the second um, speaker, who is um, an ex-classmate of mine, Professor Mushi Machila, is a uh, uh, you know, joining us for the first time while the other two profs uh, have been here before. He is the Associate Professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Kortesky in Cape Town. He is the Chair of the Academic Liaison Committee of the South African Society of Gynecologists, Gynecologists and is um, the Senate and Council Member of the College of Medicines uh, of South Africa. He's also a Discovery Foundation alumni. Um, joining us uh, for the third time is Professor Priya Somapile, who is the head of department uh, of Obst obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Pretoria, um, Steve Bigo Academic Hospital and UP Research Center for Maternal, Fetal and Newborn and Child Health Care. She's also the president of the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of South, Af of South Africa and uh, an immediate past honorary secretary of, secretary of the South African Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. She's also a member of the FIGO Executive Board. So uh, up first will be Prof. Salome Maswime, um, and uh, she will then uh, be followed by Prof. Mushi Machila, and lastly, it will be Prof. Soma uh, Pile. So over to you, Prof. Maswime. Thank you so much, Olu. It's an honor, delighted to be here once again, and 
will really be continuing from where we left off last time, uh, talking about what's the latest in, in COVID-19 uh, regards to pregnant women and what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in the rest of the world and what can be done differently. I'll be followed by Prof. Mushi Majila, who will be talking about, uh, about perinatal outcomes related to COVID and, and, and Prof. Priya Somapile will be talking about vaccination. And I think we'll all try to, to give some recommendations. And so where we left off last time and really what's been a, a key theme is women who are pregnant are at higher risk of hospitalization and severe disease than women uh, the same age who are not pregnant. This was acknowledged uh, globally that pregnancy in it, on its own is a risk factor for severe uh, disease. And the rates of, of severe deaths are higher in certain racial and minority groups. This has been seen across the world that certain population groups have got worse outcomes and especially studies that have been done in low and middle income countries higher mortality rates have been seen. Uh, interesting findings uh, regards to preterm births, and, and these are disparities. We now know that there is increased preterm birth uh, rates related to COVID-19, but however, with all the lockdowns, women working from home, pregnant women having more time at home in high income countries, the preterm birth rate uh, seems to have gone down. So this is also just something that has been interesting to note in, in across the disparities across high, high income countries and low and middle income countries. There's also been an increase in the number of ruptured ectopic pregnancies and women who require surgery for ectopic pregnancy. And this relates to delayed diagnosis because people haven't been testing early for their pregnancies, having been having sonas confirmed and, and ectopics not being confirmed early enough. Re, re, and, and ending up in delayed management and more ectop, ruptured ectopic pregnancies. And then I wanted to bring up some of the health system factors. This in fact was a paper that was published uh, yesterday. We worked on this paper with, with Dr. Buga who gave a talk last time. And some of the health system factors that are, that are related not only to COVID-19, but to maternal sepsis as a whole in low income countries uh, issues around delayed presentation, delayed diagnosis, the poor monitoring in hospitals of, of women that are there, that are sick, the shortage of ICU beds, the shortage of ventilators, oxygen shortages. And so I bring this up because often, you know, we realize why are women dying? Why are women having worse outcomes? Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not just related to, to, health, to their health condition but it's also the health system factors. And I think many of us can relate to some of the delays that happen in our own settings. And as a result, women having worse outcomes, it's not always because of the severity of the disease itself, but in a country like this and in a country with disparities, it's always, it's also the, whether we're able to provide uh, adequate resources and care to them on time. Some of the, the, the more interesting uh, issues has been maternal mental health. I think this has been a theme uh, throughout, but it's been more research and more studies looking at this. And so increased risk of postnatal depression, increased maternal anxiety, limited, and this is also related to the limited companions, no, having no family visits, interactions between patients and hospital staff have been described to be more distant during this time. And also there's been social stigma and isolation, especially when women have got COVID-19. And this obviously has got an adverse effect on, on women as they have their babies and, and look after them. And so I thought I'd bring in something different, paternal mental health, because this is becoming an in interesting new theme uh, under the theme of parental mental health. And so in some of the studies that were done, what we know is that you know some of the challenges that families have had is, is the support system, looking after being pregnant during this time, delivering on their own, some of the things that I've just mentioned, and inadequate antenatal care, loss of permission for fathers to be there at the birth, little access to, to, to the babies uh, and to, to the labor and being there during the deliveries. 
but families have not just been worried about, about that, but all the other things that have affected all of us during this time, job losses, household income, children, having children, having to homeschool children. So you're homeschooling, you're pregnant, you're not having support systems, uh, food shortages. And, and, and then also it, within families, I was found this quite interesting with uh, reports of increased fighting, uh, even in the ho at home with all of the changes that we've had during lockdown. So this has, has changed how, how pregnancy is viewed, how women experience pregnancy, and also the fact that everyone is, fear, is, is, is afraid of being infected uh, and, 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 and is, in, uh, is afraid that they might meet somebody, they might get the infection or they might pass on an infection to others. So it's changed the way we, we do everything. Uh, social stigma has become important and it's, it's the risk of infection, the risk of infecting others uh, whilst and, and within the home, uh, outside of the home, the risk of infecting your healthcare workers or the risk of being infected within the hospital setting. And of course, if the baby develops COVID and the separation, and so this has been quite, quite a, a challenging time for pregnant women. Maternal mortality has increased in many places by up to 30%, including right here in South Africa. And so this is not just women who've got COVID, but it's, it's the whole, as a whole, uh, maternal mortality has gone up uh, internationally and particularly in low and middle income countries because of the disrupted services, the national lockdowns, the fear of, of attending health, of, of women attending health services. So has the pandemic changed everything? I think it has. We've got more of a COVID-centered approach with restructured maternity care, reduced hospital uh, stays, and ways of, of doing outpatient monitoring, remote medical care. And, and of course, this has not all been positive, but has resulted in higher maternal mortality rates. And, and different outcomes in different parts of the world. So what needs to change? What are, what are the recommendations? We need much better public messaging around pregnancy. We, have, you know, we, we, we hear about what needs, about what needs to be done, which, which, which populations are high risk, but it's not being mentioned or highlighted that pregnant women are in fact a high risk population. We need to strengthen the health system to look after the patients that the pregnant women that we look after and moving away from this COVID centered approach to a patient centered approach. So I want to thank you again for inviting me and I will hand over to Prof Majila. Um, are, are you able to visualize the slide? Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, we can, we can see your slides. Just put them on slide mode. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to take the opportunity to um, thank Discovery, um, but also to um, um, really thanks my co colleagues for the platform um, oh. and really closely working with both. And also for, for the vision of discovery in terms of um, uh, its contribution to creating academic leadership uh, from within the country. So thank you very much indeed. So I'll talk about the uh, perinatal uh, effects of COVID, uh, but largely also looking at the placental um, effects. So I've called it the placental perinatal revisit because I, uh, or the similar talk that I um, gave last year at the time of, um, I think it was the second wave. Um, so I'll touch on issues that are, are important relating to vertical transmission and what the observations have been in the placenta, uh, what the peri outcomes are, um, and, and, some, and my colleagues uh, from Maswime has touched on some, and just to conclude, so really, um, so the initial reports um, really on transplacental fusions came from uh, largely the study uh, uh, from um, China that, as you can see, you looked at nine pregnant women and largely um, detected um, very little by way of evidence of vertical transmission. So uh, no detection of the virus in any of the bodily fluids uh, there. 
And again, also no evidence of um, affectation of, of other, uh, adverse outcomes. So the narrative at the time then came out um, to suggest that there was very little impact on, on perinatal outcomes. Um, and, and, and in fact, that vertical transmission was, um, what was not possible, in fact, was, was, was negligible. Uh, and then came out data from um, IgM positivity, uh, positivity in, in the neonates, um, and um, which caused a bit of a, of a concern. And subsequently, as you can see, uh, there the dates uh, advancing, uh, evidence of, of viral infection, at the level of the placenta. And so again, revisiting the issue. And that is a narrative of cumulative uh, data as of May last year. Um, showing you again, you can see largely limited to few case studies, um, showing there in green uh, positivity on the neonatal throat swabs, um, anal swabs, um, and some of the body liquid from the uh, neonates. So fast track that to this year, um, um, looking at the same, you can see that um, this is a meta-analysis examining largely what we call early onset neonatal infection, defined as newborn with a positive PCR. Um, test in the first two days. Um, and you can see that, um, you know, the data is, is, is clearly accumula accumulating, um, but, but you can see the wide intervals. Um, and that, in fact, um, only 16 out of 1,000 observations was the average um, assessment in terms of uh, vertical transmission. So largely very low, uh, very low risk of vertical transmission. Uh, but the studies um, need to be improved in terms of what they're examining at. And again, there's another study showing a transmission rate of 3%. Um, and again, showing you on the right um, where the positivity comes from, placenta, you can see high expression there, neonatal fecal samples, and so on. So 3% is a sort of um, advocated figure, um, 3 to, to, to 7% in, in some of the meta-analysis. And you can only look at systemic review and meta-analysis because the data is fast. But I think as we examine this, we need to be cognizant of Sorry to interrupt you. It looks like there are some participants who are struggling to see the slides. Oh. I just uh, am not sure. We I can see it from my side, uh, but I don't know if people still cannot see the slides. I've I've seen uh, quite a few messages coming through saying they can't oh, see. Oh, is it? it. Um, so let just get a sense if, if yeah. let's get a sense first if people still I can, can see them. Can you see them? Um, can the other? I also see them quite clearly. They and the full um, picture is on the screen. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, that's fine. So maybe it was just a, pr a problem with a few people. Uh, you can continue then. Yes. Yeah, sorry. So I think we need to distinguish between what is true intrauterine infection, which is um, really what the issue is: is that um, intrauterine exposure has really uh, not been proven convincingly. I don't think there's anyone who can. Um, uh, with convincing evidence, say that they say that they've shown in time um, positivity, and you need to and and these are the sort of um, parameters that are suggested. So you need to show maternal positivity um, uh, in the sort of fourteen days prior to birth, two days after birth, a positive swab, uh, but also positive um, another um, uh, pharyngeal swab uh, or any of those swabs in the neonate, um, along with evidence of early IgM. Um, um, expression in the baby. Um, and there's also intrapartum, of course, exposure to feces, to lipo, to, um, to, to, to vaginal secretions, um, can also give you a positive result, but you need to be aware of how you interpret that. So again, um, 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 that you will need the positivity in terms of the swab um, after two, 24 to two weeks post natal life, and, and usually IgM positivity that is far much more long extending and distinguishing it from, from superficial exposure um, to whatever agent. So in other words, the, the, the neonate is not infected uh, necessarily, but has been um, contaminated, so to speak. And that is evidenced by lack of immune response if you look at the IgM assays in, in, in early pregnancies. So the take home message really is that with current ev available evidence, the issue of vertical transmission um, is likely very low and requires further for the exploration. So I think that reassures um, us by way of what the perinatal effects may be. Um, and then of course the placenta is quite important. There, there is the, the ACE2 receptor and along with necessary um, expression of proteins that are required uh, to get the, 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 the transmission 
um, have been demonstrated in, in, in pregnancy and fetal tissues. And that's a depiction in, in, in green there, showing you that compared to the other lung tissue, there's high expression in the fetal tissues, but a very low expression in the placenta. And what's interesting is that as the gestation um, uh, advances, that expression actually goes down, which may exp uh, uh, explain why you're seeing such a low rate. One of the many reasons why you may be seeing such a low rate of transmission because it's very high in the in early pregnancy, but, but actually the expression goes down. Um, and, and we know that this was, um, as of last year, the first case of infection demonstrated in the placenta um, and also visualization in the, in the placenta. So I think, I don't think there's a doubt about um, that, you know, the, the virus infects the placenta, um, but it's quite, it's, quite, it's quite interesting to know that although there's high viral um, 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 infection at the level of the placenta, the translation to neonatal infection is actually quite, quite low. Uh, and so what has been seen in the placenta has been a fetal vascular uh, perfusion defects. So, so largely perfusion on the fetal side of the maternal fetal interface, but also maternal uh, vascular uh, perfusion, similar to those that you will see in preeclampsia or growth restriction with placental insufficiency. And so that is a review um, from, from um, um, this year showing that added to what we knew last year about maternal fetal and fetal vascular malformation, there's also in the blue there, you can see a high rate of inflammation. So, um, so I think uh, that's something to be cognizant of. So take home message here is that uh, we know that um, the, the expression of genes and proteins required for transmission of the virus has been demonstrated in the placenta. And we're seeing these vascular defects on maternal fetal side, um, but also inflammation uh, recently with accumulating data. And so it may well be that we have to increase the surveillance, but it's difficult within of course, um, pandemics, as, as uh, my colleague has already alluded to. Um, so lastly, the perinatal um, effects. Really, this was um, one of the earlier studies um, showing, uh, systemic reviews showing um, the high rates of miscarriage, uh, preterm birth, uh, preterm rupture membranes, along with preeclampsia um, in the cohort of women uh, infected with COVID. Um, but subsequent, this is a subsequent review, as you can see, published in JAMA, looking at a high, um, um, really um, um, huge population study. And you can see that looking at pre-pandemic group of, of in excess of, of 67,000, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, pandemic group of about 67,000, this is the historic group. And really looking at all these perinatal, perinatal outcome, preterm birth, stillbirth, extreme birth weight, um, severe small for gestational age, NIC UI admissions, uh, and alien late neonatal deaths, um, showing no differences. Uh, but the study, of course, was done in, in, Can in Canada. Um, and there's, a, there's another one in the Lancet Global Health relating to stillbirth, for example, um, that shows you that um, there are disparities between high income and low income countries, um, and that the data was much more tighter if you look at the um, low and middle income countries relating to stillbirth. So, um, so there's a tendency towards increased preterm uh, birth and stillbirth, uh, but the, the prenatal reports are largely compounded by direct and indirect COVID so, uh, effects of COVID, uh, which my colleague has already uh, uh, mentioned. And perinatal burden much more palpable as we would expect through health system disruptions in low income compared, um, and, and low mid middle income countries compared to high income countries. So I think it's important to proceed, uh, proceed with, with caution in terms of how we interpret accumulating data relating to these outcomes. And we need to splice out very clearly what the effects of um, the health systems are, et cetera. So this is the last slide just summarizing um, really um, that the, the effect of, uh, of COVID infection um, it, it, the hypothesis are that it may, we may be seeing these maternal vascular malperfusion and vascular and inflammatory changes at the level of the placenta, either because we, um, the infection uh, embarrasses placental uh, perfusion, results in maternal hypoxia, but also there's an inflammatory response that may result in what we are seeing. Um, and again, they, they, we know that the damage to tissue is largely related to the cytokine storm, and that may be the case in the placenta. And so, um, and that the whole issue of intratrine transmission is, is really quite, quite questionable as, uh, as, as where it stands. And peri perinatal outcomes are related to, to miscarriage, 
um, uh, still built and pre-timber, uh, but they, they are different really um, uh, comparing low income to high income countries. And, and, and of course, there's this question about the long-term effects uh, uh, such as uh, neurobehavioral effects um, of COVID. So I will, I will, I will stop there and um, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, good evening, colleagues. Thank you for joining and thank you to Discovery for inviting me to speak again. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, vaccines in women with uh, in women of reproductive age, but focusing specifically on uh, pregnancy. My outline of my talk, I'll look, talk a little bit about vaccine development and, and technology. And I want to say from the outset that I'm not a virologist or va a vaccinologist. I'm a clinician, so my talk will be clinically based. I look at some of the early preliminary data um, related to COVID-19 vaccinations, some of the recommendations from our health authorities, and then points that we should use when counseling pregnant women regarding vaccination in pregnancy. So if we look at the vaccine, um, start off with vaccine development and the COVID pandemic. I think the year 2020 will be defined by COVID-19 and will be bookmarked as a moment in history when biomedical science demonstrated its mastery of infectious agents on a global scale. Identifying the pathogen, sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 genome, developing rapid and um, diagnostic testing, optimizing treatment, and generating vaccines within a year of the first um, COVID virus um, represents an extraordinary achievement. However, it has also exposed weaknesses in multiple domains in the healthcare system, including va um, the vaccine development pathway. We know that pregnant women with symptomatic COVID are at a high risk of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation and death compared to non-pregnant women in their reproductive years. We've also observed an increase in preterm birth and stillbirth rates among women with COVID infection. And despite the increased morbidity and mortality, pregnant and lactating women were excluded from phase three vaccine efficacy trials. Therefore, the first regulatory approvals have been accompanied by um, consistent advice from public health, governmental and professional authorities all around the world. And if you remember in the early December, the first week of December, 2020, the UK government um, suggested or recommended that the COVID-19 vaccine not be offered to pregnant and lactating women. A week later, they said it should be offered to women with comorbidities. And at the same time, the USA, um, the WHO, and the Society for Maternal and Fetal Medicine um, recommended that the vaccine be offered to all pregnant and um, lactating women, irrespective of gestational age. So unfortunately, this conflicting advice um, coming from our health authorities damages public confidence in vaccine um, safety. And together with this, the lack of evidence regarding efficacy and safety studies um, in pregnant women shifts the responsibility from research sponsors and regulators and places the burden of decision-making to the pregnant woman and her healthcare provider. These are some of the um, COVID-19 vaccines that have been developed with the different technologies that have been used. The mRNA technology is new and um, hasn't been used with previous vaccine. And this is being used by Pfizer and Moderna. The viral vector um, is being used by the um, AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccine. Um, and we've used this previously and successfully with the Ebola vaccine. The whole virus um, technology has been used by Sinovac. Um, we've got experience with the whooping cough, rabies, hepatitis A, 
um, and the HPV um, vaccine. The protein subunit has been used um, previously with the hepatitis B vaccine. So if we look at vaccines in general, um, for our code of vaccine, we've had several different technologies. Most previously approved vaccines work by introducing an antigen into the body and our body produces an immune response. The antigen may be an infectious agent that has been inactivated, or it may be a purified protein from the infectious agent. Our mRNA technology, like I said, this is new, used by um, Pfizer and Moderna. It carries the genetic information necessary to manufacture the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2. And this is the protein found on the surface of the virus. Once the vaccine is injected into muscle cells, the cells manufacture spike protein, and this is recognized by our immune system. The mRNA never enters the nucleus, and it's therefore not integrated to our, into our DNA. And within hours or days, the mRNA is broken down in the cell cytoplasm. The other vaccine option that we have in South Africa is the J&J, &J, and the viral vector technology is used here. A modified viral vector is used to deliver the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 into the cells, and this then triggers an immune response. The AstraZeneca vaccine uses a chimpanzee adenovirus that has been modified so it's unable to replicate, while J&J &J uses the human adenovirus 26 that has also been modified. And like I said, um, this vaccine technology has been used previously um, to, to develop the Ebola vaccine. So although women have been excluded from early vaccine trials, we do have some data um, since the rollout of the vaccine, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, in the UK, Europe, and in America. So I'm just going to go through some of the trials um, that have been published. Um, the numbers are still small because we're in the early stages of the vaccine rollout. This pub paper was published in the JAMA in May this year, and it compares the immune response of women um, who've received the mRNA vaccine either the Pfizer or the Moderna, to a, a group of women um, who've been infected during pregnancy. So this is a population um, that we're studying, and we see that there were 103 women in the vaccinated group compared to um, 28 women in the um, unvaccinated but infected group. Um, the gestational age at which a woman um, received the vaccine. Sorry, my slide is blocked here. I'm just going to move um, this. Um, so the pregnant population in the first trimester, numbers are small, but 17% of women received the vaccine in the first trimester. Second trimester, 50% um, of 15 women. And in the third trimester, 33 women. Women who were infected during pregnancy, first trimester, there were three women who were infected um, during the first trimester, um, seven women or 32% of the women in the second trimester, and 12 women in the third trimester. Um, samples were then collected um, following vaccination, following the second dose of the vaccine, and following infection. The mean um, number of days following the second um, vaccine dose was two to eight weeks and two to 10 weeks after infection. So samples were collected to monitor the immune response. We see that after the second vaccine dose, um, a small percent of women did develop a fever. This slide looks at the IgG and antibody response following vaccination and infection. And we see that IgG antibodies were higher both following vaccination and infection compared to the baseline prior to vaccination and infection. We also see that in the vaccinated group, um, there was a higher immune response, both in terms of IgG and antibodies um, compared to the infected group of women. The slide looks at um, IG, IgG and antibody levels in maternal blood and cord blood. Again, a higher level um, of an, uh, or higher antibody response following vaccination than infection. 
If we look at um, the response in maternal serum and breast milk, um, we do have some um, antibody um, um, secretion, both in maternal serum and breast milk. In terms of IgA antibodies, um, levels were higher in um, breast milk following infection rather than vaccination. This slide looks at the T cell response following vaccination. And we see then again, following vaccination, there's, a, there's an adequate T cell response um, in women following vaccination. This slide look as, looks at the immune response, um, two variants of concern, um, the beta variant particularly. We see a good immune response to the beta 117 um, uh, variant, and this is the va a variant first identified in the UK. Some response, but less um, to the beta 135 one, and this is the variant first identified in South Africa. So what does the study tells us? It tells us that receipt of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine was immunogenic in pregnant women and vaccine elicited antibodies were transported to infant cord and breast milk. Pregnant and non-pregnant women who were vaccinated developed a cross-reactive antibody response and T cell responses against the, um, against the SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern. The second study looks at the risk of infection um, and compares a group of vaccinated women to a, a, gr a, pregnant, a group of pregnant women who were not vaccinated. Um, it was a large sample size with 7,500 um, women in each group, half vaccinated and are half unvaccinated. And if we look at this slide, we see that the first 28 days following the second vaccine, there was actually no difference in the risk of infection. But after 28 days, the, the hazard ratio um, in the vaccinated group was significantly um, lower with a hazard ratio of 0.22, a 95% confidence interval of 0.11 to 0.43, and a p-value of um, less than 0.001. So significantly lower risk of infection in the vaccinated group after 28 days. This slide looks at the uh, um, maternal and fetal outcome um, in these two um, groups that were studied. And similar to what Prof Majila said earlier, no difference um, in rates of abortion, growth restriction, preeclampsia, stillbirth, uh, maternal death, or gestational age at delivery. There has been quite a lot of concern about whether vaccination affects um, ovarian function. And there's a possible theory that the spike protein can lead to fertility problems. However, this theory is not supported by any evidence. There's also no biologically plausible mechanism by which um, the COVID vaccine could impact on women's fertility. So we have a small study um, looking at women, uh, couples visiting an IVF lab. And this study looked at 36 couples who had IVF treatment. This was followed um, by a COVID vaccine. Um, and again, they had a um, mRNA technology vaccine and um, ovarian function and patient for performance was then compared in this um, cycle subsequent to the um, vaccine injection. And there was no difference in patient's performance or ovarian reserve in the immediate subsequent IVF cycle. So in the short term, we know there's no, um, the COVID vaccine does not affect ovarian function, um, but we need further studies to look at the long-term follow-up of these patients. So I'm going to go through some of the re recommendations from our um, authoritative bodies. The Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists say that um, vaccination should be offered to all pregnant women. They prefer, uh, or the, they, they prefer the Pfizer, the Moderna vaccine. But if the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been given, then women should complete the course. COVID-19 vaccines can be given at any time in pregnancy. However, in low risk situations, women may choose to delay the vaccination until 12 weeks. 
if, however, if women have a higher chance of contracting the infection, or if the woman is at a high risk of severe illness, then the vaccine should be offered at the earliest opportunity, including the first trimester. And breastfeeding or fertility treatment should not delay um, vaccination. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists recommends that pregnant women have access to the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, vaccines should be offered to lactating individuals, similar to non-lactating individuals. Um, individuals considering the vaccine should have access to available information regarding safety and efficacy, and including the fact that data is still unknown. There should be a conversation between the patient and her clinical team um, regarding decision making. And important considerations include the efficacy of the vaccine, the risk and potential severity of maternal disease, including the effects um, of the disease on the fetus and the newborn. The safety of the vaccine um, for pregnant women and the fetus um, should also be part of the discussion. What does our South African Department of Health says? Um, in South Africa, we have both the Pfizer and the J&J &J vaccine, and our Department of Health says the vaccine should be offered to all pregnant and breastfeeding women who are eligible um, to be vaccinated after 14 completed weeks. So this has caused a bit of confusion, um, and the, the vaccine rollout is now open to women older than 35. So this group is now eligible. However, women younger than 35, um, the, the, vaccin the vaccination has not been open to them unless they fall in one of the special categories, and that is health workers, um, the police, social services, um, or the teachers. So at the moment for women under 35, um, these women need to be part of the, one of the special categories, and they are being offered the J&J &J vaccine. Our Department of Health also says that healthcare workers are encouraged to discuss the risks and benefits of vaccination. These discussions should include the fact that safety data um, in pregnancy and breastfeeding is currently inadequate. However, women should be informed that there's a strong immune response conferred to mothers following vaccination, and they should also be told about the benefits um, of passive immunization. Furthermore, there are no risks associated with other non-live vaccines given routinely to pregnant women. Non-pregnant women contemplating pregnancy are strongly encouraged to be vaccinated as soon as they are eligible to do so. So I'm going to conclude now with um, three slides um, just discussing some of the points that we should consider um, when counseling our patients. It's important to know that it's a pregnant woman's choice to have a vaccine against um, the COVID virus. If she is undecided, the role of the healthcare provider is to enable the woman to make a decision through an informed shared decision-making process. So what should we be telling our patients? They should know that there's a lack of data on pregnancies during um, vaccine clinical trials. However, there is extensive evidence for safety of other vaccines during pregnancy. The Pfizer vaccine has an efficacy of, of about 95% against symptomatic COVID, while J&J &J has an efficacy of about 66%. In terms of timing, our South African National Department of Health recommends that the vaccine be taken after 14 weeks of gestation, and there's no need to stop um, breastfeeding or delay um, fertility treatment, and women do not need to delay conception. Some of the um, potential risks, or what can we tell women? It's important, or, in or first in terms of benefits, there's a, there's a reduction in severe disease for the women. There's a potential re reduction in the risk of preterm birth associated with COVID-19. There's a reduction possibly in the risk of transmission to vulnerable household members if the woman is vaccinated and potential protection of the newborn from COVID-19 by passive antibody transfer. Some of the risks or side effects, if she does take a vaccine, um, there may be a minor local reaction 
um, with pain and redness at the injection site. She may develop a fever in the first 48 hours following the vaccination and treatment with antipyretics may reduce this risk. Um, she may also develop a headache and myalgia. Rare thrombotic events have been um, reported in women under the age of 50 following the AstraZeneca um, and J&J &J vaccine. These are, the, are similar events um, as reported um, following um, heparin um, use. And these, the, the risk is one in a few million. Um, the risk is unpredictable or the, 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 the event is unpredictable and it's not associated with any of the usual risk factors for venous thromboembolism. There's also no evidence to suggest harm to the fetus following vaccination. What about women um, declining the vaccination and what point should we consider in this situation? We should let women know that most women will have no symptoms in pregnancy. However, some will develop critical illness. The risk for critical illness is higher for pregnant than non-pregnant women. And the risk is particularly high in the third trimester. Pregnant women are also more likely to be admitted to the ICU than non-pregnant individuals. And she's got an increased risk for preterm birth and stillbirth if she has symptomatic COVID. So it's important to do an individualized risk assessment and particularly assessed um, for comorbid conditions, particularly hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you to all our speakers today. I'm gonna call back um, Prof. Salome, Prof. Mushi. We've got some questions for you, but maybe while they are still coming back, a few questions specific uh, around uh, vaccination uh, in pregnant women. Um, there was a, a question around uh, the timing of the vaccine. Um, so our National Department of Health recommends that women delay vaccination to after 14 weeks um, gestation. Um, and for a woman who might have had um, an, act, an acute infection of COVID, Oh, so vaccination following um, an infection, an infection, then one should wait at least four weeks or a month. Yes, 30 days. Okay. Um, so just maybe going back to Moshi. Um, is Moshi back on? Yeah. Okay. They want, they, there's a question from Mark uh, asking if you would then advocate routine testing for the virus in the various tissues when the mother has been shown to be positively infected in 14 days prior to birth? Yeah, so, um, so I think uh, practically um, the, sorry, I need to put this on, um, that really practically the, the issue of, of, of vertical transfer, so in particular intrauterine transmission um, has not been demonstrated convincingly. And a lot of what may happen is that is, is, is infection during um, delivery and probably early neonatal infection. And so um, the, the, the issue of routine testing is not, for example, uh, practiced by my neonatal colleagues here. Um, um, unless, uh, you know, unless there's specific clinical uh, suspicion um, or unless the, uh, and the testing policy uh, here uh, which is a tertiary level facility, is for those going for surgical intervention. So it's not even for management of patients within the NICU, for example, um, whose mothers are positive. So long as there hasn't been contact, physical contact um, between the mother and, and the neonate, um, they, they, there is no practice or, or, or suggestion of, of routine testing in positive mothers. I, ho I hope that, that addresses that. Thank you so much. And then another question is around whether uh, it means that preterm infants are likely to have vertical transmission. So I, I don't know if maybe that is covered in your question. Yeah, so, right. so it's quite right. interesting. Thank you. Um, it's quite interesting because it probably relates to the expression of the, of the ACE2 um, receptor, which um, as I've demonstrated is much higher in earlier pregnancy. 
Um, and so the expectation has been that, um, that you're, you're probably much more vulnerable in early pregnancy um, because of this high expression of um, not only the protease, membrane protease um, um, receptor, but also the ACE2 receptor, uh, which seem to go down as you advance in gestation. So theoretically, that's expectation. But to date, even in those who have had severe infection um, in early pregnancy, and when they've had the placental samples, uh, interestingly, there hasn't been much by way of, um, by way of, of, of demonstration of placental infection. So, so obviously there are these mechanisms um, at the maternal fetal interface where on the one side, um, there, is, there is this requisite maternal immune tolerance. You know, the mother has to have this immune tolerance to, to be able to accept the conceptors. But on the other hand, quite different mechanisms that are employed to protect the conceptors against infection. And, and, and that's probably these innate mechanisms um, that, that result in such a low transmission that we see. Mm. Thanks. Another question is around the indication and timing of delivery in COVID-19 ventilated uh, patients. Yeah, so I think um, you, you'll have to then um, really go according to um, the issues of viability and the gestation at which the mother presents. Um, and, and I think where there is um, issues or question around viability, you'll always optimize um, um, the mother in terms of prioritizing um, delivery. Where, uh, for example, um, you, you are way away in terms of um, um, you know, reassurance that there will be good perinatal outcomes and they may be aiding in terms of ventilating the pregnancy. Um, so period 34 weeks, between 30 and 34 weeks, I guess. Um, then there's consideration for, um, uh, for delivery um, um, to aid that, but it also depends on the maternal um, status at presentation. Um, so, so, you know, um, I think the priority is, is, is always to optimize maternal outcome uh, as much as you can um, and, um, and, 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 and subsequent fetal considerations. So that would be sort of, I, I know it's a much more general approach, but my colleagues are also around to, to give their, their thoughts. Thank you. I don't know if, they, if, if, the, the, if, if Priya and Salome want, want to also just add to that. Okay, so that's fine. Then there's a question around, and I think you, you, you covered this, uh, Prof uh, Samapile, around the timing of the vaccine um, in pregnant women. Um, the question was, uh, should women trying to get pregnant currently go for their vaccines or should they wait till later in pregnancy? I think you might have already uh, covered this in terms of the timing, but I think it would be yeah. nice to reiterate it. So I would recommend that all women planning pregnancy, and this is what the Department of Health is also recommending, that all women planning pregnancy get vaccinated before um, their pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fine. And then there's a question around whether COVID can be transmitted via breast milk or is it only antibodies post-vaccination that are then transmitted? So again, there's very limited data um, showing or demonstrating um, the virus within breast milk. Um, and so, um, um, Again, I'll relate to the practice here um, that, that um, so breastfeeding is not, we should encourage breastfeeding. There's absolutely no reason why we should be um, advocating against breastfeeding. Um, but of course, in the acute phases of the infection, uh, you will have to, to practice uh, infection control practices and, um, and you can use express breast milk uh, for those. So, so there's absolutely, um, to date, there's very little data by way of demonstrating evidence in, uh, of, of transmission by breast milk. Thank you so much. Uh, there's an, a question here that says, now that we know that vaccination does not prevent COVID infection 100%, how valid is the statement that vaccination can prevent preterm birth? And is this associated with infection and not severe illness? So vaccination prevents severe illness and severe death. It may not um, completely prevent infection. It does lower one's risk for infection, 
um, but this it the it significantly lowers one's risk for severe infection and hospitalization. And it's in these patients where we are seeing the higher risk of preterm birth. Most of our symptomatic, um, asymptomatic women um, actually go through their pregnancies uncomplicated. So it's the women that are admitted to hospital and require high care ICU admission that we are concerned about. And this is um, what vaccines reduce. It reduces your risk of hospitalization, ICU admission, and death. And we're seeing that in the UK now, where there's been a surge of infections, but the, um, the death rates have been, really, have been low. Thank you if, so if much. If I could just add, add to that, um, uh, to what they are saying, um, and I fully agree with that statement. It seems to be the dose effect. So in other words, um, the much more severe the illness, the, uh, the more the association with adverse perinatal outcomes. And that was very beautifully demonstrated by showing that um, you your, was doing uh, your PCR test and, and, and you assess cycle count. There's a very close association between the low cycle count, which corresponds to a very high viral load with adverse perinatal outcomes. There's no doubt about it. So I fully agree with what Priya is saying. Um, that, that, of course, the, the vaccine will then lower your chances um, by way of that. Thanks. Thank you so much. There are various questions around vaccine preference uh, during pregnancy, looking at the data. Uh, uh, you, know, if, you know, more data for Pfizer versus J&J, &J, and therefore, um, in, in, in our setting, I think our guideline is actually saying you can give uh, any of the two that are currently available. Your thoughts around uh, that? So there's definitely more data um, with the use of the Pfizer vaccine, so the mRNA technology, um, um, because that has been used predominantly in the Europe and in Europe, UK and, and America. Our um, data on the J&J &J vaccine in pregnancy is limited. However, we do not think um, that um, in terms of side effects um, to the uh, to the fetus that, 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 that is, the performance is any different. So we don't think that the J&J &J vaccine will cause any harm to the fetus. Thank you so um, much. One last question, I'm, 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 I'm cognizant of time. Uh, there's quite a few questions around, you know, uh, the use of, of in fact, um, vaccinating women in the first trimester, considering that our guideline is saying uh, 14 completed weeks um, is if a woman already falls pregnant and not uh, knowing uh, that they are pregnant and they get the vaccine, is there any harm? And also, um, if, if there is a requirement, uh, can people be offered uh, the vaccine um, in their first trimester? So you'll see that the UK and the US um, do recommend vaccination or, or do they, they do offer women the vaccine in the first trimester. Um, and study on animal uh, models have not shown any harm to the fetus. Um, even with the mRNA vaccine, the, um, the, the vaccine is not, does not interfere with DNA. It does not go into the nucleus of the cell. So it, it shouldn't cause any harm to the fetus. And experience with other um, vaccines with similar technology and in animal studies have not shown any harm to the fetus. One should be aware of, however, is that um, about the 20 to 30 percent, there is a 20 to 30 percent of women who receive the vaccine report fever um, in the first 48 hours following vaccination. Um, the first 14 or 12 weeks are the most vulnerable in terms of teratogenic effects, and there is a small potential risk um, of. Um, small risk of new, um, congenital abnormalities, particularly neural tube defects. So women are, um, it's recommended that as soon as she develops a fever or starts developing a fever, then she takes something to bring down that temperature. Um, and because we are not, um, we don't have sufficient data in the first trimester, this was a recommendation from the South African National Department of Health. The Royal College is also saying that let low risk women um, can consider delaying their vaccination to after 12 weeks. Thanks, I thought, uh, Prof. Salome? 
Yeah. Also, just I want to agree with that and also add that I think the key principle that we need to remember is vaccine equity and ensuring that pregnant women are not left behind, that as we go already, many people are not vaccinated, but as we drive for vaccination, that pregnant women, should, we should not be excluding pregnant women and so be driven by principles of equity in promoting this. Peter is asking the question that I asked the three of you, and I'm gonna ask it again. Should we, uh, should you, and all of us, as uh, you know, as as uh, obstetricians, uh, not be lobbying for pregnant women to be prioritized for the vaccine? Yeah, I'll answer first. It, it goes without saying. We 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 need to advocate for pregnant women. We need to stand up for them very little is said about them. And this results in women not, not seeking care, in women not receiving the, the level of care that they should. So we definitely need to, need to advocate for them and, and combine our efforts as, as different groups that can stand up for, for this. Thanks. Thank you so much. There was another question, and I think I, I have to ask it because maybe there are other people who are not aware of the timing between a flu vac and a COVID vaccination. Um, so I don't know if you want to take that one timing, two weeks between a flu vac and COVID vaccine. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so it's not the, at the same time. Where you not a, no, no, one should wait. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. We've received uh, various questions. We've tried to address them as best as we can. We thank our speakers today, profs, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for sharing all these important insights. And uh, we hope we hope that you'll go and lobby for pregnant women to be prioritized for, for the vaccine. Uh, please uh, remember attendees that we do have a poll. Share your feedback with us. We thank you for joining us and thank you uh, to our speakers once again and have a good night. Thank you.